Hello, comedy fans. Mary Lynn Rice Cub is a comedian, actor, writer, and now a published author. Check out her stand up at Cap City Comedy Club tonight, July 12th. Tickets for that can be found at capcitycomedy.com. And her new book, Famish My Life at the Edge of Stardom, is available now wherever books are sold. And now, my conversation with Mary Lynn Rice Cub. I guess I should warn people at this point that the last time you and I spoke was literally a week and a half before the COVID pandemic hit. So um, if nuclear war happens at some point uh, after the Tuesday night show that you have here, it may be our fault. So no pressure on this conversation. I I don't mind, you know, if it's going to happen, let's just, let's get into it. We're, I think, uh, you know, our country, we're ready for it. Whatever, whatever's going to happen. Just like bring it. Yeah. Well, and uh, at least you can check the published author bit off of uh, the checklist now, which is something else that we had talked about. It was, I think something that you said two plus years ago that was brewing in your head was uh, COVID the impetus to finally convince you to take the time to actually write it. Yeah, absolutely. That's exactly what happened because all of my stuff was live gigs that were lined up and uh, it was just kind of perfect timing for me to write a book because I had tried to do it like 10 years ago and it just wasn't like gelling the way that I was approaching it and finding the voice to do it. And I had even talked to somebody about helping me with the proposal or I, I, at the time, I believe it was like someone who was going to help me with the writing, but like, I didn't really need that. But at the time I just was like, oh, this is how you do do it. You meet with somebody and they help you organize it. I don't know. It was just, I was, it, it wasn't the perfect storm of how it came together, you know, where I had the time and I had, you know, a decade of life and experience and comedy under my belt that I just was in a different position and then COVID. And then I was able to find the combination to dial into what the voice of the book would be. And it was pretty daunting, but it was very fun to do. Well, in my hypothetical best beach reads of 2022, your book would find its way onto that list. Yes. And not just because you cover some of your time in entertainment, although there are plenty of entertaining stories from that, it's you, you really span your entire life and just funny or transformative moments that happen throughout the course of your life. And that does include going back to your childhood. As a matter of fact, one of your first jobs had nothing to do with entertainment and everything to do with working at Denny's. Yes, trans- that's one of my favorite. I love that you picked that one out of the gate to talk about. So how transformative was it to be the person making ranch dressing at Denny's? Um, I mean, that's one of my favorite uh, essays right there. And I appreciate that you you kind of got what I was doing with the book because I do have celebrity stuff, but I couldn't, unless there was something where there was a conflict or it was transformative, I couldn't like dig into that. And that Denny's thing, um, I was dictating that to my friend who she ended up helping me put the book together. She was a real catalyst because I was doing solo podcasting and um, she transcribed one of the podcasts for me because she was helping me do a bunch of stuff. And she said, I think this is a chapter of the book. And that's how I found, I was like, oh, I'm a performer. Like it makes sense that I would speak it, you know, and certainly the transcription you cringe because it's the way you speak is super clunky, but, but I would use that as the template to then write into that. And, and the Denny story was, I was telling her. So it's like, again, as a performer, it's like, I I was able to really clue into like, Oh no, I'm telling you the story of working here. And it just, that made it more ridiculous when I imagine like having an audience and it becomes this thing of, you know, where the voice is like, oh, I'm so great. And and I honestly did feel at the time, uh, which comes through in that chapter of like, I'm not good enough to work at Denny's, you know, like I put the uh, manager up on a pedestal and describe her, you know, beautiful hair and her 80s vest she was wearing. And, you know, I think you can feel the real truth in that and imagine as well as I can remember sitting there just like shell-shocked as a very insulated, shy, you know, not very 
um, savvy out in the world, uh, you know, that I didn't had didn't have a lot of experiences with the world at large. I was just, you know, a kid from the suburbs that sort of kept to myself. So that was, you know, with like self-esteem issues. So there's no way I'm walking in there like, hello. It was just like, oh my gosh, I didn't even think I was good enough to make it at Denny's. So that whole chapter is about, you know, rising and not only getting the job, but eventually becoming a server, not just a bus person. And then eventually being given the secret to making ranch dressing, which of course is ridiculous because it literally is a large envelope of Hidden Valley Ranch and buttercream that you whisk together. So the secret is there's no secret. Yep. Sometimes the secret is a little bit underwhelming. It's like learning a magic trick or something, I guess. That manager, by the way, I don't remember if you described her as a, she struck me as a Denny's lifer though. Like it would not be surprising at all if she is doing something within the Denny's corporation to this day. That's right. She was hard as nails. And you, you hit upon something of that is the, that is the theme of the book, which is, you know, I call it famous, my life at the edge of stardom. And again, there are, Hollywood stories. So, you know, externally, it, it is about the actuality of being famous, but internally, it's it is about expectations, because we all have ideas of what we think success would be or our version, because fame implies like, oh, this wonderful thing where you get all these perks. So it's like climbing up this hill to be an employee at Denny's. And then you're like, I'm going to be let in on the secret of the ranch dressing. And then it's like, oh, it wasn't. Once you get there, it's not that mysterious. And, you know, some of the more literal fame pieces are the one where I get invited to the Golden Globes. And again, that's like something turns out not how you expect it to be. And that's an example of something that, you know, is in the world considered one of the most glamorous pinnacles of success. And then my story involves being invited, which is incredible, but then realizing I'm not given a plus one. So there's all these, you're dressed up, you're this, you're that, you get a car, it's the most beautiful table set, and I'm just alone, and I'm not allowed to go sit with the people that I work with. I mean, that's insanity. Um, but, you know, again, I, cor I um, parallel that with, um, personal stuff too. What, what the idea of something that doesn't turn out the way, you know, like my marriage, I have this idea of this is what I want. And then when you get there, you're like, Oh, this isn't, um, what I thought it was going to be or what I wanted it to be. And I think that's a very, we all have those examples in our lives of once you get there, everything shifts, you know? Yeah, I do want to talk a little bit more about you uh, really being earnest with your vulnerabilities regarding uh, relationships from the past and also traumas from your past. But I did also find it interesting to learn a little bit more about your plight as a performer. It starts with, I think, uh, an improv class at the University of Michigan. You eventually, uh, you are an art student, but you eventually move out west with a friend of San Francisco, then Los Angeles. And you wrote about an Anything Goes talent show at a place in L.A. that I think was called the Spades Club, maybe. How did this experience impact the direction of your career in life, Mary Lynn? Um, well, that one in particular, I think what you're talking about um, is having gone through. I went to art school. I was doing performance art. I was out in San Francisco doing all these like funky live shows. I was just very attracted to like being out in the world at bars and like these open mics. And at that time it was open mic poetry nights. And then I got invited by a friend of mine to go to LA to do live shows. And that, you know, I was just really interested in being a solo performer and I didn't really see, you know, even to this day, people are like, uh, certainly I have comedians now that I relate to obviously after years and years but at that time I didn't re really relate to being a stand up cuz that didn't that had nothing to do with me and my experience and my personality that's a guy in a suit who's confident so my entry into this was being invited to LA um and all these comedians they were kind of crossing over and performing in these funky places that weren't 
comedy clubs. So you got all these different levels of like absurdist, you know, and when I came to LA, that's when I happened into this scene of people that really um, validated me creatively and inspired me creatively and, and made me feel like I belonged and I felt like they belonged to me. It was just a very um, fruitful, creative, um, uh, you know, bountiful time in my life to be around all these amazing people that it just sort of organically happened that way. And, and, um, you know, when I say outside of the comedy club, I'm talking about people that are working, were working and still are working at a very high level. I mean, at that time it was Bob Odenkirk and David Cross developing Mr. Show, which still to this day is living another life through pe through another generation. That's like, somebody copied the VHS and it's like living on as this like iconic, uh, groundbreaking sketch show. But at that time it was also, you know, seeing some of the first shows that Jack Black and Kyle Gass did as Tenacious D, you know, it was seeing Janine Garofalo and, and Julia Sweeney and Kathy Griffin and, and all of these voices that were so different than what that, um, straightforward, typical stand up comedian, um, archetype is, which funny enough, I'm now coming back around to that at this point in my life, which I never thought I would be here, but I'm, you know, more of a road comic now than I ever had been. But, um, yeah, which just to full circle on that thought was, um, I, I did a ton of live performances and, and obviously got caught up in acting, which was wonderful but it came out of me doing these live performances and being seen by casting directors and, and, and being around people that were in the business that then started giving me opportunities to try out for these acting roles. Um, and I think it's because I was creatively, you know, I felt like safe and nurtured to just be kind of the weirdo that I was. And that's what was appealing, um, at that time to, to show up as an, as an actor, you know? That had to have been so liberate, liberating to get to do that on stage and, and really entertain and amuse people in the process too. Oh, it's amazing. I mean, it really is. Even though I have like an attitude about it, I really am so grateful that it's like this therapy and this self-discovery and a lot of my early acting jobs and I think this is not that unusual, but I got to learn on the job, you know, mm -hmm. I got to sort of become, as I was getting these jobs, I, I was lucky enough to not bite off more than I can chew. And I, I didn't have to do years and years, you know, at a theater academy. I just kind of like jumped into it. Um, and that was how I approached the the live performance as well, which, yeah, is very, um, scary and gratifying. And, you know, I was just compelled to do it. So. So obviously the reason why you're in Austin is for a show at the newly reopened Cap City Comedy Club, new location. I've heard great things so far. Uh, have not been there to check it out just yet. Can't wait to do so. People can get the tickets at capcitycomedy.com. And you wrote in the book that for a long time, your stand-up was performance art heavy. When and why did you shift away from this and go more traditional with what it is that you're doing on stage? Um, I think the performance art thing for me was, yes, I was drawn to it. Um, and... Um, it was important to me, but at the same time, um, I think it was performance art because I, because I was un, unformed as a person and as a creator, and I wasn't exactly sure what my voice was. Mm. So that's why I was picking all these elements that were highly personal, but abstract at the same time and kind of throwing these elements together and out into the world. I mean, I remember a few years into me doing this at shows. I'm sure he doesn't remember this at all, but Greg Proops backstage was like, I don't even know like why people like you. You're not even 
doing anything. And I had a really good friend of mine, what years later, tell me, he goes, yeah, you, you didn't have any material. Like I just went out there improvisationally with like abstract idea at words or phrases or behaviors. And I just was walking this tightrope of it's, oh, it's like a performance art piece, a perpetual performance art piece of a person trying to figure out how to express themselves or like, I think people were worried about me, like wondering if I was going to be okay. So, and then the laughter was from when they realized, oh, okay, like she made it through this next moment. Like I would get so nervous. It was a form of torture in a way to perform like that because I would be prepared to be present, but really ill prepared in terms of here's what I'm thinking about. Here's what I want to say. Like the, I, the audience wasn't sure where I was going to go at any moment because I wasn't sure where I was going to go. So that's the thing that made it like hmm. awful, but like wonderful, you know, and like bad, but also like really exciting. And then the moments that were good were really, really good because you knew it was like being created in the moment. Um, but you know, now it's like, I've had a lot of experience. I've done a lot more writing. I've done a lot more performing. I've done a lot more living and, and speaking and figuring out who I am. And of course, you know, when you go on the road, I, I, back then it was a bit of a cocoon of, you know, the LA scene and a lot of people who were already in that, you know, they had, the, we had the luxury of, it was people who were in the business and people who were artists themselves. So there was a capacity to have a, a patience for that and an appreciation for that. And now when you go to a comedy club, which is so funny that they still exist, which I thank God they do, but you know, and I think we're always going to need them, but um, it's different. People have paid. They want to be entertained. They don't want to see you like, dick around you know not that i was because i took it very seriously but i yeah. didn't know what the hell i was doing you know right. and and people who pay money and 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 are expected to get it buy two drinks and you know leave the leave their kids at home they're coming out for entertainment they're not coming for like a creative experiment or like you know they're not a casting director that's like oh that's interesting i've never seen that before they're like I want, I want the show. And, um, that's become a different challenge for me. And, you know, I enjoy being able to be clear about what I'm saying. You know, back then there was a lot of mumbling and looking down and, and, and switching words mid sentence. And a lot of, you know, maybe my face is saying something different than my words are saying, you know, it was just very like, um, a real, a real jumble of a bunch of different things. And I learned with like stand up, like the art of stand up. the more clear you can be, that's going to be better for jokes. It worked really well for me getting acting jobs and, you know, being creative and finding it, but it sounds like it was filled with irony. And speaking of irony, I find it ironic that Greg Proops was uh, so miffed by your act back in the day, considering that he made his name based on whose line it is, is in any way, which is another one of those formulas where you're not really going in with much of a game plan. Well, he probably was like, I'm actually improvising and I have thoughts and feelings and like, how dare you just basically you're saying you're not really doing anything. Right. But I think maybe looking back on it now that we're bringing up poor Greg Proops, he's a lovely, lovely, hilarious, I agree. I agree. kind person. And I'm sure, yeah, like I said, he probably doesn't even remember that. But um, I think now that we're talking about it, I probably was doing a version of Who's Line, but just with not words, with like attitudes. I think that's what it is. And I just figured that out in this interview because it wasn't um, just that I didn't know what I was saying. I did have something to say. It's just, I didn't have it figured out. So it, it was coming out with like tone and attitude and irony and like delivery. 
Mm. But it was like a mystery that was unfolding for the audience and for myself of me trying to figure out where it is. So that's the difference because I see him always as somebody who's like so articulate and so is like, no, this is what I want to say. And then I want, I want to say this, 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 and this. And I'm closer to that now where it's like, oh, these are the topics I want to talk about and I don't want to waste time. But at that time, that's, that's all I had to work with because I wasn't clear on my own mind and my own things that I wanted to say. I just didn't operate that way for whatever reason, you know? A couple more questions here, Mary Lynn. First off, uh, I feel like you and I have very similar senses of humor. I'm a, a weirdo deep down as well. And so I loved you admitting not being able to help but to laugh about the ridiculousness of the acting profession, whether it's making out with Tom Cruise and Magnolia for a scene that was ultimately uh, ended up on the cutting room floor or going through a torture scene in 24 and laughing about it after the fact. I cannot help but to laugh when I see actors that are having to act like they're dying or dead, knowing full well in reality that they are completely alive. Have you ever had to act dead before? And if so, what's the key to acting dead? Hilarious. Uh, yes, I have acted dead before. Just like, try not to breathe, you know? That's really the truth. <laughs> Don't have an itch. Yeah. Don't yeah. breathe. Yeah, the- uh, Get the, up in between takes because it's hard to be dead. It's hard to hold your body in that position. Yeah, move around as much as you can when you can. Okay, and how did you end up buying a million dollar mansion to serve as an unofficial women's commune and an adopted home for an anus-less dog from Florida? Oh, thank you so much for reading my book. It's all in there. You know, that's a story that I told, but I still haven't really figured it out. Maybe <laughs> like now how I'm looking back at the performance art, I still need a few years to figure out how and why, even though I told the story of it. It's like, I really still don't understand what I think I was just throwing stuff up against the wall. Yeah, I think that might that might be my thing. I just I didn't know how to have like a family and money and a job and be successful. And I just was like, this is, I'm going to do this differently. And I just did a bunch of things wrong, but kind of a great story. Like I don't regret it. In some ways, maybe trusting to a fault, like wanting to think the best of people and then ultimately being used in the process too. You might be right. I mean, I wasn't going to say it in that way, but that is true that cause that's, I mean, yeah. So we've talked in the past. A little too trusting maybe. Yeah. I, I feel you. I've got family members that are the same way. It's perhaps why I'm so jaded towards mankind. Um, we, we talked uh, a while back and you discussed earlier in this conversation about stand up being a great way to help you work through issues in your life in a unique way. And obviously this book helped out with that as well, but I have to think that writing about past relationships that went sour and maybe lasted too long as all bad relationships tend to do or going through traumatic experiences was one of the most difficult things about this project. Is that what you think about it as well? Um, it's definitely, and I think acting has some of these aspects to it too, even though you don't, I think no one should ever take anything that seriously when you go to like act a scene similarly to writing some of these stories um you really do relive it and it's you know for better or for worse which i hope it's for better because i think it's maybe like going back to process stuff um that obviously there still is enough uh, enough juice enough friction there because those were the only things I keep thinking like anyone who's like always studying Philadelphia fan is going to be disappointed that there's no story about which I could tell that that story, but it's like the guys were great. It was really fun. Like there was, there was no conflict there or no, like certainly I discovered something coming up with the character of Gail the snail, but not in a way where I knew how to write a really good story about it. It would have just been a really quick anecdote of like, yeah, Danny DeVito was really nice. And, it was really fun to do. Like, I didn't know how to. So, yeah, all of these things, I think, have some unresolved um, 
you know, emotional entanglements or just stuff that I thought was fun or relatable or interesting. Um, and where I tried to look, look at myself in, in the process of doing that and have some perspective on some of that stuff. Um, but it, it's weird. I mean, writing's weird because I definitely am a performer and an actor who's writing a book. So I don't know what that's like for like people who are full-time authors because you are you're, you're you're digging into something, you know, you know what I mean? There's 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 an aspect to it that's not altruistic. There's an aspect to it that's like what can I exploit to get the good story, you know? Absolutely. Uh, yeah, Mr. Show doesn't come up in the book a whole lot either, and I'm guessing it's for similar reasons, right? Um I mean, Mr. Show, it, in my memory, me describing that whole scene was sort of the precursor to Mr. Show, and that was the magic to me. Mm. A lot of that's a blur to me in terms of I was there. I mean, there was like, yeah, I was just happy to be there. And, um, but it kind of all is mushed together in my head of being in that whole scene. And I, and I feel like I did justice to describing that club and the people that were there and the kind of performances. Um, so yeah, I feel like I was a player in Mr. Show and very proud of it. And like, these are my people, but at the same time, it's not really my show, you know, I'm a player in it, but Interesting. Well, uh, that was a very en enjoyable role for you and plenty of others that you do describe in this book. You talk about acting lessons from Gary Shandling, Kiefer Sutherland. I mean, th this really is one of uh, my favorite books to have read so far this summer. For those of you who still have a little bit of beach time left, definitely check it out or just check it out because you like uh, a good, funny, heartfelt book, which Mary Lynn has done with Famish, My Life at the Edge of Stardom. Also make sure to check her out at Cat City Comedy Club tonight, July 12th. Tickets can be found at capcitycomedy.com. Mary Lynn, it's always a pleasure getting to catch up with you. Thank you so much for the time today and uh, safe travels back to uh, California. I'm so happy that you read the book and that I got to talk to you about it. Thank you so much. Thanks to Gentleman Jesus for the intro and outro music. Hear more of his work at GentlemanJesus.com. And thanks to Joshua Bates for the video editing. If you have any video editing needs, hit Josh up on Instagram at Forager Digital. And thanks as always to you for checking us out. You can watch, listen, learn, and connect for free at BooksOnPod.com. For Books on Pod, I'm Trey Elling. Good day.